So Donald Trump wants a Supreme Court justice who will throw the election to him if it's contested in court. Do we think he's getting what he's bargained for? Let's talk about day two of Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation hearing. Because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So we are on day two of the marathon confirmation hearing for Amy Coney Barrett. Although with Lindsey Graham presiding, maybe we should call it a hypocrisy-a-thon, um, given that we are now in the middle of a hearing that Lin Lindsey Graham promised the American people would never take place. Four years ago, he said there will be no Supreme Court Justice confirmation hearing in year four of a Donald Trump presidency. Hold the tape. Use my words against me, is what Lindsey Graham told us. And now he's presiding over a confirmation hearing in year four of Donald Trump's presidency. And I will tell you, I loved when Senator Whitehouse today, during the, the, during the hearing, called Lindsey Graham's hypocrisy out, called him out by name. And he said, you know, when you find hypocrisy in the daylight, look for power in the shadows. That's what Senator Whitehouse said after accusing Lindsey Graham of unbelievable hypocrisy by holding this hearing. I, for one, look forward to the day when Lindsey Graham is no longer soiling the Senate. But let's talk about Amy Coney Barrett. So let's talk about form and then substance. So first, let's start with form. She is a strong, smart, accomplished, poised, almost stoic woman and witness in these hearings. In many ways, I would say she is the anti-Brett Kavanaugh in her demeanor, in her civility. Now, when it comes to substance, it's impossible for us to say whether there's going to be any daylight between the judicial philosophy of Amy Coney Barrett and the judicial philosophy of a Brett Kavanaugh. But I want to just hit three big ticket issues that I saw emerging as I watched the confirmation hearings today. And those three issues are guns, the Affordable Care Act, and recusal. That is, will she have to remove herself from a case involving a challenge of the election results? Let me start with guns, because what I heard troubled me. There was an opinion called the Cantor, in the, in the case called the Cantor case. Um, she's an appellate court judge, of course, and as an appellate court judge, she would sit on three judge panels and hear and decide appellate cases. Well, in this Cantor case, Cantor was a convicted felon who didn't like the fact that the federal law said a felon can't possess a firearm. Well, two of the three judges on the panel said, well, the law is what it is. It says felons can't possess a firearm. Cantor is a convicted felon, so he can't possess a firearm. Amy Coney Barrett wasn't happy with that answer. She wrote a dissent in that case that was longer than the actual opinion by the two-judge majority in the case. And she said, and I don't want to sell the opinion short, I don't want to turn this into a law school class, and I'm going to try to be fa fair when I characterize her dissent. She said, look, the Second Amendment right to bear arms is a fundamental right, a constitutional right. And I understand that the law says if you're a convicted felon, you can't possess a firearm. She said, you know, and there are other laws, like if you're a convicted felon, you can't vote. And then she said, you know, the law that says if you're a convicted felon, you can't vote, that's fine. We can deny a convicted felon his or her right to vote. But when it comes to a law that says if you're a convicted felon, you can't possess a firearm, I don't know. I think that interferes with the fundamental right under the Second Amendment. So what I want to see is an added element, a heightened showing by the government 
that a convicted felon would be dangerous if he possessed a firearm. Mind you, that's not in the law. The law just says convicted felon can't possess firearm. And she didn't like that answer. Um, and I have a problem when a judge will look at two fundamental rights, the right to possess a firearm, the right to bear arms under the Second Amendment, and the right to vote, and say two laws that say convicted felons can't possess firearms and can't vote. Well, can't vote is just fine, but can't possess firearms? No, I think there should be a higher showing. Well, she's not a legislator, so that's not her decision to make. I was troubled by her dissent in that case and by her testimony in these hearings when she was questioned about that matter. Um, the NRA, mind you, loves her dissent in that case and her opinion that there somehow should be a different set of rules for laws that say convicted felons can't do certain things when it comes to if that certain thing is possessing a firearm. I disagree with that and I disagree with the two judge majority in that opinion. That's a concern. Second issue, the Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare, right? Um, I will always be straight with, with you all. So I will say when I read the Sebelius case that was the Affordable Care Act case, right? Um, it was attacked as being unconstitutional and it made its way up to the Supreme Court. And Chief Justice Roberts decided the case, when I say decided it, he wrote the majority opinion. And what he said was, okay, under the law, the ACA, it, it talks about imposing a penalty if you don't have health care or you don't sign up for health care. I don't know if a penalty is constitutional, so I, Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the majority, am going to kind of flip the script and I'm going to call it a tax because a tax would be constitutional. That's something the federal government could do. So when I read the Sebelius case in which Chief Justice Roberts um, employed some um, creative reasoning, I as a career prosecutor and as a lawyer, I was somewhat skeptical of that opinion. So I am not outraged by the fact that Judge Amy Coney Barrett has expressed skepticism with Chief Justice Roberts' reasoning in that case. However, that opinion is now the law of the land as handed down by the Supreme Court. It determined that the Affordable Care Act was constitutional and as a result, tens of millions of people have relied on it to get health care, including for pre-existing coverage for pre-existing conditions. So even though I agree that the reasoning was creative, it is the law of the land. It is precedent. And it is something that is um, worthy of respect and deference if that issue is to come up again. And we all know it's coming up again in November in another case, making a similar attack on the constitutionality, the legality of the ACA. So, this boils down to how Amy Coney Barrett views precedent. And I'm going to talk about that in a future video because there was a good bit of discussion about precedent and super precedent, right? And Brown versus Board of Education, which thankfully did away with the horrific separate but equal doctrine, government-sponsored racial segregation from a case called Plessy versus Ferguson, and Brown versus Board of Education put a nail in the coffin of Plessy versus Ferguson's horrific, separate but equal government-sponsored racial segregation doctrine. And people say, well, Brown versus Board of Education can't be touched. It's not only precedent, it's super precedent. I'll talk in a future video about whether super precedent is really a thing. And then is Roe v. Wade super precedent? There was some talk about that today. Precedent is precedent. And when the Supreme Court rules that the Affordable Care Act is constitutional and tens of millions of people rely on that and get health care as a result, thank goodness, precedent is deserving of respect 
and deference. We'll probably talk more about that in a coming video. But the, my takeaway was I was not shocked or frankly outraged or concerned that Amy Coney Barrett expressed skepticism about Chief Justice Roberts' um, reasoning in that case because I viewed it with some skepticism myself when I read it years ago. But it's precedent. That's the important point from my perspective. The third thing is recusal. I don't mean to turn this into a law school class, but just bear with me because recusal is important right now, right? Because Donald Trump has stated and tweeted that he's trying to put Amy Coney Barrett on the court because he wants her and the other justices to throw the election to him. I'm taking liberty with his actual words, but that is the message. He said, I need nine justices up there to look at the ballots. What a ridiculous thing to say. So that raises the issue of recusal. If an election case, if an election contest made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court, would Amy Coney Barrett be entitled to stay on the case and decide it? Or would she have to remove herself, recuse herself from the case and not participate in the opinion? And she said some things that frankly gave me a comfort level. She said that, and, and, and they weren't any different, the things she said, than what other justices said in their confirmation hearings about if a matter came up that you thought you had a conflict in, would you recuse yourself? And the rule is, well, I would look at all applicable law, all applicable precedent, how different laws and precedent were interpreted over time, and I would consult with all of the other justices before making a decision about whether I should take no part in a case involving a challenge to the election. That's the right answer, but here's my take. You can have a conflict you can have to remove yourself or recuse yourself from a case if you have an actual conflict or if there's an appearance of conflict. Appearance of conflict is something that cannot be negated in this case. Why? Because Donald Trump said to the American people, I'm putting her on the court so she can throw the election to me. Nothing Amy Coney Barrett can say or do can overcome the appearance of that conflict such that if she participated in the case and ruled that the election should go to him, it would not be viewed as legitimate ever by anybody who actually cared to think critically about it or rationally or logically about it. She can never overcome an appearance of conflict and therefore she would have to recuse herself if that case came to her. I don't think it will come to her because Donald Trump will not have a legal leg to stand on to launch a challenge against the election results after he gets crushed in a landslide because we vote in numbers too big to rig and too real to steal. And we will. He can't then walk in the court and say, I tried to rig the election. I appointed a criminal postmaster general to interfere with the mail-in ballots. I told my supporters to vote twice, commit felonies, to try to get me elected, and now I want to challenge the results. He can't do it. He's going to get laughed out of court. But God forbid, if an, an election challenge made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court, I predict, I do this at my own peril, Amy Coney Barrett will recuse herself and the other eight justices will rule against him unanimously. They will probably advise her to recuse herself just to protect her reputation and the reputation of the court because the appearance of conflict cannot be overcome given what this knucklehead president has said and tweeted about why he's putting her, trying to put her on the court. And then take this as you fall asleep tonight. Don't forget his other two draft picks, his other two uh, justices that he has put on the court, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, both ruled against him in the tax litigation, and they will rule against him again in the unlikely event an election challenge makes its way up to the Supreme Court. Let me finish with one other point, um, and then I'm going to tackle some of the other issues like super precedent and Roe versus Wade in a video tomorrow or the next day because 
It looks like we're going to remain in this Lindsey Graham hypocrisy a thon for the next few days. I got a kick out of the Republicans crying and moaning and belly aching about the fact that Joe Biden might try to put an additional um, justice on the court. He might increase the numbers and that would be the, the end of the criminal justice system and the end of our democracy. It would, gosh, be so unfair. Please, first of all, through our history, we have had different numbers of justices on the Supreme Court, as few as five and as many as 10. Nine is not a magic number. Nine is not required by the Constitution. So it wouldn't be unlawful or unconstitutional or improper to add additional justices in response to the Republicans' games. And here's the thing. The Republicans reduced the number of justices from nine to eight for nearly a full year by unconstitutionally depriving Merrick Garland of his confirmation hearing by refusing to do what the Constitution says they must do, provide advice and consent, they wouldn't do it. They, in fact, reduced the number of justices for nearly a full year from nine to eight. So, you know, let's not cry crocodile tears over the prospect that Joe Biden might, and he hasn't said he will, and I suspect he probably won't, but might put an extra justice or two on the Supreme Court to counteract the Republicans, among other things, unconstitutional conduct of refusing to give Merrick Garland a confirmation hearing. All right, that was a lot to pack into a short video. Um, and tomorrow I'm gonna to turn my attention to some additional topics about the Amy Coney Barrett hearing. We'll see how it plays out tomorrow. And in the meantime, folks, please stay safe. Please stay coronavirus free. Uh, if you're inclined to support our efforts and our content, feel free to go to patreon.com and become a patron, sign up. We would be uh, grateful. Um, and in the meantime, I look forward to talking with you all tomorrow.